Chapter 13, The Sectional Crisis. Slavery's westward expansion was unyielding. Battles emerged over both the westward expansion of slavery and over the role of the federal government in protecting the interests of slaveholders. Northern workers, even those who supported black laws across the North that suppressed the rights of free blacks in Northern states, argued that slavery suppressed wages and stole land that could have been used by poor whites to achieve their economic independence. I mentioned black laws, different than the slave codes of the South, black laws of the North. Southerners feared that without slavery's ability to expand westward, the abolitionist faction of this emerging Republican party or this free soil movement would come to dominate the national political landscape and an increasingly dense population of slaves would lead to bloody insurrection and a race war. Constant resistance from enslaved men and women required a strong pro-slavery government to maintain order. As the North gradually abolished human bondage, enslaved men and women headed North on the Underground Railroad of hideaways and safe houses. Northerners and Southerners came to disagree sharply on the role the federal government should play in capturing and returning this increasing flood of freedom seekers. While Northerners, many of them inspired by the abolitionist crusaders, appealed to their state's rights to refuse capturing these runaway slaves, white Southerners demanded a national commitment to slavery. Enslaved laborers, meanwhile, remained vitally important to the nation's economy, fueling not only the Southern plantation economies, but also providing raw materials for the industrializing North. Differences over the fate of slavery remained at the heart of American politics, especially as the United States expanded state by state. After decades of conflict, Americans North and South began to fear that the opposite section of the country had seized control of the federal government. By November of 1860, an opponent of slavery's expansion rose from within the Republican Party. During the secession crisis that followed his election, fears, nearly a century in the making, at last evolved into a bloody war. As the threat of Southern secession loomed, an effort at a grand compromise to the slavery question, crafted by the aging Henry Clay, was brought to Congress in 1850. Stephen A. Douglas, a senator from Illinois, succeeded in breaking up Clay's compromise into a series of bills that could be voted on separately. As such, the Compromise of 1850, again broken up by Senator Stephen A. Douglas, was a victory of self-interest as different factions across the country got bits of what they wanted on the slavery question, a free California for abolitionists, stricter fugitive slave laws for Southerners, et cetera. Still, Congress enacted all of the components of Clay's compromise in short order, and the effort was hailed as a triumph of statesmanship that would hopefully settle the sectional problem once and for all. An uneasy truce held for two years after the passage of those laws, when abolitionists then began to break away from the Whig party and join the new Free Soil Party over the enforcement of one component of the compromise, the Fugitive Slave Act. For many years, men and women who had escaped their chains and joined new communities in the North were continually being ripped away from their new families and jobs and forced back into the bondage of their former masters down South by federal soldiers when discovered and identified. Mobs began to form now in Northern cities to present, uh, prevent enforcement of the Fugitive Slave Act. In the case of Anthony Burns and other black community leaders, uh, and some states passed their own local state laws barring the deportation of these fugitive slaves in opposition to the Federal Fugitive Slave Act, which had been a central component of the Compromise of 1850, which the South had cheered. White Southerners watched with growing alarm as the central element of their Compromise of 1850 that they had supported um, was made moot by Northern defiance. As a codicil uh, to the slavery question, as more and more settlers were moving westward onto the Great Plains and opening up new territories for expansion, uh, the question of what routed a transcontinental railroad from the East Coast to the West also stoked the slavery debate. Northerners favored an Eastern terminus at Chicago, a Northern city, while Southerners very much preferred St. Louis, Memphis, or New Orleans, more Southern cities. Both sides scrambled to make a more favorable case to Congress. For Southerners, that meant buying a strip of Mexican land that had threatened to complicate the, their preferred route. And for Northerners, it meant legally annexing Indian lands that blocked their progress to a Northern route. Stephen A. Douglas, in an effort to secure Northern Rail Route, drafted a bill called the Kansas-Nebraska Act that catered to Southern interests. Again, looking for compromise here. His bill repealed the Missouri Compromise while opening up the territories of Kansas and Nebraska to white expansion and thus a Northern Rail Route. 
The bill also allowed these new territories to decide their own slave state or free state status as they came into the Union. After fierce debate, the Northern Democrat president, Franklin Pierce, signed that bill into law in 1854 with the unanimous support of Southerners and the tepid support of Northern Democrats. No piece of legislation in American history proved so many immediate, sweeping, and ominous political consequences. It destroyed the Whig Party, in effect. It divided Northern Democrats, and it spurred the creation of a new political party that was sectional in its composition and creed. Those opposed to Douglas's bill began to call themselves Republicans, sort of an homage to an earlier era in American history, and they quickly took power in the United States House of Representatives. The Missouri Compromise and the 36 parallel line it drew between the North and the South as states came into the Union uh, was no more. And now the rules of the game would change when it came to individual states now joining the Union. After the passage of the Kansas-Nebraska Act, the Missouri Compromise that had uh, so divided the United States on the 36 uh, parallel uh, and sort of settled the question of which states could be slave and free was no more. Now it would be self-determination uh, that would guide this process. And so we're going to have uh, acrimonious uh, ratifications of state constitutions. After the passage of the Kansas-Nebraska Act and the invalidation of the Missouri Compromise, white settlers poured into these two new territories, Kansas and Nebraska. Thousands of Missourians, some traveling in armed groups, swelled the ranks of those people of Kansas just before the elections were held for the territorial legislature in an attempt to swing the status of the state toward permanently slavery. Outrage free staters wrote, in a wrote a separate constitution and then petitioned Congress on their own within the state of Kansas for statehood. We have dueling groups arguing for statehood. President Franklin Pierce denounced the free staters as traitors and threw his support behind the pro-slavery legislature. Efforts to intimidate the free staters in Kansas was met with violent retribution. John Brown, we'll talk about quite a bit. John Brown, he was an abolitionist zealot uh, who had moved to Kansas to see it become a free state began to murder slave state settlers now. Bouts of guerrilla warfare broke out among the factions and bleeding Kansas, weeks and weeks of, of bloodshed and war, became a powerful symbol of the sectional controversy uh, in the United States. In the United States Congress, around the same time frame, a war of words over slavery, uh, where uh, in the United States Congress, a war of words over slavery led Preston Brooks, a South Carolina member of the House of Representatives, Preston Brooks, to nearly beat Charles Sumner, a Massachusetts member of the United States Senate, to death on the floor of the Senate. While Sumner became a martyr to the barbarism of the South, he was representing sort of the, the free state or the free soil impulse uh, among Northerners, Brooks became a hero to Southerners and easily won re-election after being censured by his colleagues. They sent him canes, which he'd used to beat uh, Sumner nearly to death. Southerners sent Brooks canes as in, keep it up, bring the fight to the North. These tensions were a reflection of the hardening of ideas on both sides of that old Mason-Dixon line. In the North, assumptions about the proper structure of society came to center on the belief in free labor. Free labor. The argument that won the day in the North was not the radical abolitionist argument. Most white Northerners now came to believe that slavery was dangerous, not because of what it did to blacks, like many abolitionists had argued, but what it threatened to do to white people. At the heart of American democracy, they argued, was the right to own property, to control their own labor, and to pursue opportunities for personal betterment. The South, then, was the antithesis of democracy. It was a closed, static society in which slavery preserved an entrenched aristocracy in which you could not rise through the ranks. The South was a stagnant place, and their aristocracy threatened the free enterprise and prosperity of the northern states. The only solution to the slave power conspiracy in American politics was to fight the spread of slavery, and extend the nation's free labor ideals to all sections of the country. This ideology lay at the heart of the Republican Party. The election of 1856, just four years before the onset of civil wars, is relatively inconsequential. It pitted candidates with very short political resumes against one another. Neither man would have been up to the task of, of settling these, these controversies. The Democrat James Buchanan, a meek and indecisive former minister, um, was narrowly elected, but quickly shrank in the face of an economic depression and a strengthening Republican Party. His election portends, uh, portends the coming dissolution of the Democrats. It was in this era, the Supreme Court's Dred Scott versus Sanford decision that brought the high court into the slavery debate and really fomented the coming of the, the Civil War. 
it seemed in the lead up to the Civil War that no idea, no group, no political leader was up to the task of uniting this dividing country. The election of 1856 pitted candidates with very short political resumes against one another. The Dem Democrat James Buchanan, a meek and un indecisive former minister, was narrowly elected in that uh, presidential election, but he quickly shrank in the face of an economic depression and a strengthening Republican Party. His election is more of a symptom of the continuing weakness of the Democrats to unify. In this environment, the Supreme Court's Dred Scott versus Sanford decision brought the high court into the slavery debate. Dred Scott v. Sanford, Supreme Court decision. In their various findings in the 1857 case, the majority of the Supreme Court argued that Dred Scott, a former slave who had lived in free states and had been found free by lower courts after his master's death, could not bring a case to the court because blacks had no claim to citizenship at the federal level. Blacks were property and Congress possessed no authority to pass a law depriving persons of their slave property. The Missouri Compromise, therefore, had always been unconstitutional indirectly as a result of this court ruling, even though it was, it was long gone. While an individual state was still free to prohibit slavery within its borders, the federal government was suddenly powerless to regulate slave laws in the United States. Southerners were elated and Republicans threatened to stack the Supreme Court with additional justices to reverse this decision. Buchanan timidly endorsed the decision and shifted his focus to Kansas, which after much politicking uh, was able to enter the Union as a free state. Let's put Dred Scott up here. After the Dred Scott decision, there seemed no viable path for Congress or the federal government in general to take any real action on, on, on the topic of slavery. Now it would be the admission of individual states was the only opportunity, a very political enterprise, uh, for any changes to come in the form of slavery within the United States. Northerners were crushed. Given the gravity of this sectional crisis, not only was the, the South sort of pulling away from the North, but now the North after the Dred Scott decision was pulling away from the South, the congressional midterm elections of 1858 took on special significance. A particular note was the United States Senate race in Illinois, which pitted Stephen A. Douglas, who had helped author the Kansas-Nebraska Act and who had secured a Northern rail line for the Transcontinental Railroad, but had given the South concessions, um, against Abraham Lincoln, who was largely out no, uh, unknown outside of the state of Illinois. Lincoln was a successful, modest lawyer who had long been involved in state politics. He'd been a soldier in the Black Hawk War. He tried to raise his profile by challenging Douglas to a series of debates leading up to the election, which attracted enormous crowds and media attention. At the heart of these debates, the Lincoln-Douglas debates, was a basic difference on the matter of slavery. While Stephen A. Douglas admitted no moral position on the issue of slavery, Lincoln extended the argument and suggested that if blacks were not entitled to basic human rights, poor white laborers might soon join their ranks. We'll see an extension of free labor here. While Lincoln believed that slavery was wrong, he was not an abolitionist in the true sense at this point. He could not envision an easy alternative to slavery in areas where it currently existed. And he shared the prevailing Yankee view that slaves and whites were not prepared to live side by side as equals. He and his party, his Republican party, would arrest the further spread of slavery and would trust that the institution would gradually die out where it existed. He believed this policy to be in keeping with Article 6 of the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, which had cemented his home state of Illinois as a free state decades before his birth. Lincoln lost his bid for the Senate in that race, but Republicans did well nationally, and Lincoln's views on the subject began to gather a sort of national following. His ideas his ideas. He, he will help encapsulate this free labor uh, argument. And at the expense of the Whigs, the Republican Party will continue to slowly grow in popularity, especially across the North, while the Democrats will mostly find themselves concentrated uh, in, in the South. Before the great emancipator, as he came to be known, took his turn on the national stage, it was the abolitionist John Brown who nearly instigated war with the slave states. After success in Kansas, John Brown tried to organize a slave insurrection in the South, with the financial aid of many prominent Northern abolitionists. He and 18 followers seized control of the armory at Harper's Ferry, Virginia. Harper's Ferry raid. But he was eventually besieged by United States soldiers under the command of General Robert E. Lee. Well, John Brown and his six followers were hanged following their attempt to spur this insurrection. No single event did more to convince white Southerners and Democrats that they could not live safely within the confines of the United States any longer. Many Southerners believed incorrectly that John Brown's raid had the official support of this Republican Party, and they feared that the North was firmly committed to producing a full-scale slave insurrection. 
As the presidential election of 1860 approached, the Democratic Party was divided between Southerners who demanded a pro-slavery candidate and Westerners who supported the idea of popular sovereignty or the policy of allowing states to choose their own free or slave state status. The presidential convention fell apart for the Democrats and two candidates were nominated to represent the party on the national ballot. This was not that uncommon, but it hadn't happened for a while. Republicans, meanwhile, worked harder to broaden their appeal, especially across the North. They supported popular sovereignty like the Westerners wanted, and they funded domestic improvements and supported other old Whig party policies, tried to really absorb as many Whigs as they could. Republicans also argued that neither Congress nor the territorial legislatures could legalize slavery in the territories. They chose Abraham Lincoln, an Illinois lawyer, lawyer with no political baggage who had not even won his Senate race as their candidate. With a divided candidate field, Lincoln won the Electoral College majority, but secured only roughly about 40% of the American popular vote in that election. So more people voted against Abraham Lincoln than for him. Though Republicans failed to win control of Congress, the election of Lincoln became the final signal to many white Southerners that their position in the Union was hopeless. It was only going to get worse from here. Harry Beecher Stowe's widely popular novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin, had foreshadowed, as they feared, the men and the women of the northern states' new willingness to fight to end slavery in the United States. Within a few weeks of Lincoln's uh, victory, the process of political disunion had begun even before Lincoln took office.